Hey, it's Dry Bear. And I just finished my third playthrough perfecting my elemental summoner build, so we're gonna go over that guide today. But first, you should come hang out with me on my live stream. I'm live every single day on twitch.tv forward slash dry bear. If you do come hang out with me in the community on Twitch, the next time you go to your favorite store, they're gonna be having a sale on items that you were going to get anyways. Now this is the one sheet for the build for progression, leveling stats, and that sort of thing. You'll find this, you can screenshot it here from the video, or I'll have this uploaded online so you can get this down in the description and down below in the comments as well so you can save it for your build. But for starting stats, for this build specifically, we're gonna be going for Conjuration Wizard, focusing on summons, elemental summons, and then concentration spells and amplifying the damage of our teammates. You actually don't need that much intelligence here because your minions are gonna be doing most of the damage and your party members are gonna be doing most of the damage. You just need a lot of concentration to maintain your summons and concentration effects and to help you survive so you can move around in the fight and support your minions and teammates. One of the things I like about the Elemental Summoner is that aside from other summoner builds like Necromancer, the Elemental Summons all have a wide variety of abilities, spells, and effects that can affect different situations, apply different status effects, and move around the battlefield in different ways. So the more you use your Elementals, in combat, the more you master what situations they're better at, and it gives you this really nice wide set toolkit that you can use in almost any situation, depending on which elemental you select. For starting class, we want Wizard. We're gonna go subclass Conjuration. For our first feat, I recommend getting Warcaster. We're gonna be doing a lot of spells that are focused on concentration. Warcaster gives us a bonus on that, so it helps us, and it means that our opportunity attack can be stronger because you can do a shocking grasp instead of a melee attack for your opportunity cast, which means that you can actually deal some good damage when you're in melee range and someone tries to leave you. We are going to go ahead and pick up 8 Strength, 13 Dexterity, 17 Constitution, 16 Int, 10 Wisdom, and 10 Charisma. And we do this because, again, we're going to be trying to maximize our uh, Constitution as high as we can so we can maintain their, those concentration spells as, as often as we can, we'll be getting gear that goes through that as well. For this build, you can actually go for uh, Wizard 11 and then maybe Sorcerer 1, Warlock 1, Cleric 1. All of these are great choices. But personally, I think just getting the extra feat is just fine. The reason you want to go to Wizard 11, which is different than most classes in D&D and in Baldur's Gate 3, is that at level 11, that's when you get your tier 6 or level 6 spell slots. And that's when you get your highest level of elementals. So you want to go to at least Wizard 11 to get that. And since you're one away from the feat, you can pick that up or you can go into Cleric 1 or for the armor or the other bonuses or concentration spells, that sort of thing. But for unlike most other classes, I recommend going at least to Wizard 11. Now on the right side, I have the recommended spells to pick up here. There's a lot of flexibility in this game. You can play however you want, but the big spells you want to focus on, the ones that are key and core to this build that aren't just flavor is going to be Flaming Sphere. You get this at level 3, and this is going to be your bread and butter until you get better elementals. And do not sleep on Flaming Sphere. We'll talk about all the different minions later on in the video and how good they are and how to use them, but Flaming Sphere will carry you through most of the game by itself and has tons of awesome applications that we'll talk about shortly. Then at level 7, you're able to pick up Conjure Minor Elemental and Evard's Black Tentacles, which are both conjuration spells you'll benefit from massively. The Minor Elemental gives you three different kinds of minions you can get, and they're all exceptionally powerful if you know how to use them. Then at level 9, you'll get your Tier 5 slot. We'll unlock Conjure Elemental, which is going to be your higher level elemental, and Cloud Kill, which is another conjuration spell. And the reason that these, the category is important there is that at level 10, the conjuration passive that you get for going that subclass is focused conjuration, which means that you are immune to breaking concentra concentration on a spell that is in the conjuration category if you just take damage. They have to actually do something else to interrupt you. And this is busted in this game. For any of your concentration spells that are conjuration, if you take hit, you can hold it. And so this works amazingly for Cloud Kill and Everd's Black Tentacles especially. Everd's Black Tentacles, you put it down, enemies that walk across it will get rooted and they can't get out. You can just put it down and just rain down on targets and targets standing in the Black Tentacles, attacks against them have advantage, which means you get insane damage bonus on them. They can't move and they can't stop you by shooting at you. They have to do something else to stop it, which just makes it completely, completely busted. Then at Wizard 11, there isn't actually a T6 or a spell level 6 slot, 
that for Conjure Elemental. However, if you uprank Conjure Elemental, the, the level five spell, and cast it at level six, it unlocks the final version of all elementals the Myrmidons, which are incredibly strong. Now let's go over gameplay, and at the end of the video, we'll talk about the gear that you're gonna wanna know about uh, that kind of affects all of this. I'll go through all the gear you can find and unlock in Act 1, Act 2, and Act 3, but I'll save it at the end for people that don't want spoilers on based on where the item is located and where to get it. But the one item that I will start with for the gameplay portion is the most gameplay impacting item that you can get, and one that you do not want to leave Act 1 with without getting it, is going to be these gloves right here, the Abyss Beckoners. You can get these in Act 1, and they are incredibly, incredibly strong. You pick these up in the Zentarim hideout next to Joaquin's Rest in Act 1 towards the north part of the map. And when you get these, these unlock the Demon Spirit Aura. And what this does is that the wearer summoned creatures, and this applies to any summoned creatures that you have, whether they're undead or elemental, it doesn't matter. Any summoned creatures you have, will have this aura and it gives them resistance to all damage types while they're standing inside of it, except psychic damage. And it's a toggleable passive and you will want to toggle it on and off. You can see that as I'm walking around with these gloves and the aura is on, I have this big red line that's following me around. So if I summon my elementals and I put them down on here, they will gain the demon spirit aura. And when they have the demon spirit aura on top of them, they gain resistance to all damage types except for Psychic unless they already have a negative resistance. So they have high resistance to every damage type that is in there. There's one downside with the minion, with this aura that you just saw, is that while minions are standing inside of the aura, every turn they will have to succeed a wisdom saving throw or be driven mad. And that's why it entered into uh, combat just now, is that while you have this aura active, they can actually go crazy and start attacking the nearest target, which sounds like a downside, but actually really isn't because on their turn, when they're driven mad like this, they will only attack targets that are the closest to them. So you wanna just be positioning them always so that they can be standing next to enemies at all times. Most of the elementals are melee anyways, so you can kind of have them there and you get an unlock at level uh, level, level six, benign transposition teleport, and this allows you to swap, uh, it can, you can teleport anywhere in, that you can see in range. You can also swap locations with allies and minions. So you can walk up to an enemy, get in melee range, and then swap with one of your minions while your aura is active, and then if they go crazy, they're still just gonna attack the nearest target anyways, so no harm, no foul. But the reason I point this out is it's a big core part of your gameplay, when you're not in danger, you will want to toggle this aura off. And as soon as you toggle it off, it removes all the madness effects. Your minions no longer have to uh, deal with that. And you have your elementals just moving around. And then when you, your turn comes around or you enter a combat, you can put the aura back on, give them the major insane resistance. And this is super useful because some of the elementals have powerful abilities and effects, but they don't have as much HP. So giving them crazy tankiness goes a long way. Now the first major summon that you're going to get is going to be Flaming Sphere, and you get this at level 3. And this one is not to be slept on. This is one of the most powerful spells if you know how to use it. And it I've seen people knock it, but it is insanely powerful. So what you do is you, you target this location, and rather than it being a permanent summon, it is a per turn. It, has, it exists for 10 turns, and it is concentration, which means if you break concentration, the flaming sphere goes away. So you summon it, and I'm gonna put it in turn-based mode so he doesn't just expire on his own. But the first use for this is that he has this flaming aura around him at all times, which means that at the start of someone's turn, at the end of their turn, they take anywhere from two to 12 fire damage. So if he's surrounded by six enemies, every time that enemy ends a turn, they can take upward of 12 fire damage. So he's just pulsing fire AOE in all directions. The other thing is that he's always causing fire damage, but he's immune to fire damage, which means that you can cast Grease directly on top of him, deal an explosive fire damage to everyone around, and you won't be damaging your minion at all. You can throw Grease bottles, you can throw oil barrels, oil containers, oil bottles. All of these will cause fire explosions around everyone around. You can do rune powder, smoke powder, things like that. And no matter what, they won't take damage from the fire damage, but everyone around the sphere will. The next thing is that he's, uh, his collision is massive, like very, very wide. 
He's hard to get around. And so what you can do, is, especially in uh, tight corridors or kind of like urban areas, like the monastery in Act 2, you can actually just place him in a doorway, right? So this door can be here and you can just move him into the doorway and no one can get through the door. Your, your sphere is here burning anyone that gets close. You can destroy objects that are in the way. They have to kill the sphere in order to get through because he's just he's so fat and wide and he, they can't get through. And you can just, on your character, you can step out, shoot someone over the sphere, and then step behind the wall. You can't be targeted. They still have to target the sphere. But remember, we have Demon Spirit Aura. So you can turn this on and give your sphere all of these damage resistances, every single one of them. So he's way harder to kill. And while you're channeling, they can't stop you. So you're just hiding and the sphere is hitting. So this is one of your best abilities in the early game. The next thing I want to point out for your early game experience with this build is that you are a wizard, which means you can learn anything from a scroll. That is kind of the, the trademark aspect of wizards. And what you will find in Act 1 is a scroll that you can't learn this ability unless you're a warlock as a ritual spell. So there's no way to access summoning these minions unless you're a warlock. However, underneath the Blighted Village in Act 1, which is very early on, uh, near the Necromancy Lab, if you go towards the Necromancy Lab where the Book of the Dead is, and you go left and you exit that way into the undead area, in one of the coffins you will find a scroll that has the quas summon quasit, uh, which is a demon on it. And you can learn it as a wizard and it counts as one of your minions. Now, there is a little bit of a, a, a conversation that goes on with having this, but just pick up this scroll inside of Act 1, right click it and click learn on your wizard. And now all of a sudden you can summon a quasit for the very beginning level of the game. And you can have him, you can even name him and he will fight for you. And what's cool about this one, it's another minion, but he can also go invisible. He can cause Frighten on enemies. He does decent damage. He has a 1d4 plus 3 slashing. And he can just move around. And he's another minion that you can control and use. And it works for your summoning build. And he's permanent, not concentration, unlike this, the Flaming Sphere. So you get this extra benefit here. So I would recommend getting the gloves and also getting this scroll underneath the Blighted Village where you first meet the goblins and learn it as a permanent spell for your wizard, and now you've got another minion that you can call yours. All right, now let's talk about the other elementals and summons that you can use. I do recommend picking up Animate Dead. Uh, it is an easy free one. You're not gonna have as many ghouls or uh, zombies or skeletons that a necromancer would, but it would benefit from the aura you get from the gloves anyways, and it is a permanent minion that doesn't require concentration, which is pretty useful. But I would use the Quasit and the Flaming Sphere to get you through the first half of the game and then once you finally unlock the minor elementals things really start to pick up for you this is a level four spell spell slot and you can choose from three different kinds of elementals a fire azure which is a single elemental two minor elementals of ice methods or two mud methods personally i would recommend going with the methods in almost every single situation just depending on what you're up against whether they're going to be cold resistant or if you want the mud e extra to slow them down but what's great about these methods is that when you summon them you summon two with a single cast which is awesome so now you have two that you can use they have a breath attack which is this big it does frost damage which is incredibly powerful they also have a ranged chromatic orb attack which can be incredibly strong you can shoot from a distance and do uh, ice damage on that as well they also have a melee attack that they can use that does Pretty significant damage, 4 to 17 plus bonus cold on top of that. They also have the ability to fly, which means if they're down below somewhere and you need them to get somewhere up high, uh, you'll just be able to click fly and then they can fly up on top. You don't have to worry about uh, elevation in any way. They can just get to where they need to go and just try to keep them in the aura for the damage resistance. And lastly, both the mud and the ice methods for the minor elemental conjurations when they die, they have a death burst. They explode and deal damage to all targets near them, which is huge. So what you want to do is just keep them in melee range at all times. Do as much damage as you can with them. And if for any reason they get targeted, they get hit, they get killed even through your demon spirit aura, they will just explode and deal damage to all targets in the area and create an ice patch if it's ice or a mud patch if it's mud, cause them to slip and fall or slow them down and prevent them from moving. And then when you have these here, you can just summon these again. And these are permanent elementals. These are not the, uh, the concentration-focused flaming sphere. 
But you can have both, right? By the way, you can have your methods, you can have your closet, and you can have your flaming sphere, all different elements if you wanted with different abilities and functions and focus, which is pretty cool. Your, your last option for minor elemental is the Azir. It's one that I wouldn't really recommend going as often unless you really just need a tank. And you can run both of these if you really wanted. You can have kind of both on top. So you can have, of course, the methods on there. But if you try to summon the mud methods, it'll destroy those. <clears throat> and if you really wanted, you can have maximum of two minor elementals out at once. So you could, if you wanted to, summon two methods. And then when one dies, you can just summon the Azur, which is just one. And then you'll have one method of some of one of the two types. And then the Azur as well. What's great about the Azur is he has more HP than the methods do. He comes with a Searing Smite, which does decent damage when he hits a target. And he has a shield and rather respectable defense as well. So if you need someone to hold the line in the front, he's got 20 AC. And he also is, uh, he can't be disarmed. He's got kind of this cool uh, dwarf look to him. He can do Weakening Strike, which is pretty cool. Backbreaker, which is pretty cool. And then if he heats up enough, he has a special ability where he is able to overheat, which release, which just kind of releases fire in an area. All nearby creatures take fire damage. Uh, and it will burn for three turns as well. So you can actually run him with the Flaming Sphere and get some pretty strong AoE damage in general. So you can run, if you wanted, a Mephit, and when one dies, replace it with an Azur, and then you have the Flaming Sphere, and then you have your Quasit, and you're all inside of the Aura as well. So you got some options across that. And then just remember that you can kind of use these as Kamikaze if you wanted. Just keep them in melee range of the target. In case they get killed, they'll explode and do even more damage. Next up, you'll unlock Conjure Elemental at level 5, which is going to be the next tier of your Elemental Summons. At first, at, at spell slot 5, you'll gain access to a pure Elemental of one of the four Element types. Air Elemental, Earth Elemental, Fire Elemental, and Water Elemental. And they all have different purposes and usages. In general, the Fire Elemental does the most damage, so if that's what you're looking for, if that's what you want, and I would just recommend summoning the Fire Elemental, and it is separate from the Flaming Sphere, which is Concentration. It's separate from the Minor Elementals, which you can have up to two of. It is its own category, and you can have it as well. You can see at base, the Fire Elemental has 102 HP. Not only that, but every single turn, the, the Elementals can teleport, which means they can always be in the right spot to deal damage. They can do a big AoE uh, erupting Cinder or Water, or they can do like a Knockdown if you do the Earth version or you can do a knock back with trembling legs on it. And then they also have a multi-attack, which can do incredible amounts of damage. Uh, for a target, you just hit, hit, do multiple hits of damage. You can see it does upfront damage plus the bonus elemental damage. And you can have these kind of just walking around and doing insane amounts of burst. And of course, keeping them in the demon spirit aura means that you keep them durable at the same time. The air elemental version does a little less damage than the fire, but does have gushing air, which is super useful and you can apply the shock debuff, and it's great against targets that are weak to either thunder or lightning damage, so you can kind of pick and choose based on that. The earth elemental probably does the least amount of damage overall out of all of them, but he has two very useful effects. Not only can he knock targets back and launch them off of ledges and kill them that way, he can also create periods, uh, areas of mud, which if you're against a target that doesn't really deal with rough terrain or difficult terrain that well, Great choice on the Earth Elemental, it'll create a lot of mud there. And you can also apply Trembling Legs, which means that you'll lose a lot of movement speed and their dexterity is reduced. So again, against like Gith Yankee and stuff like that that are very hip hoppity, hip hoppity, the Earth Elemental is going to slow them down a good bit. And you also have the Water Elemental, which is going to be really useful for uh, targets that are reacting to your fire. So if you have your Minor Azure or you have your uh, Flaming Sphere, if the water elemental breathes winter's breath on top of the target if it's a burning target it will cool them and make them brittle and the brittle status effect makes them uh it makes them vulnerable to thunder and bludgeoning so if you have other characters in the party that do that elemental type you'll get lots of value out of that as well those are the four different types for uh the tier five option but the reason i suggest going to level 11 for wizard is because when you hit Level 11, you unlock your tier 6 spell slot. And while there isn't a tier 6 Conjure Elemental spell that you can get in the game, if you go to cast Conjure Elemental and you have a tier 6 spell slot, you'll unlock the final version of the elementals in the game, the Myrmidons. And these things are basically like adding a fifth party member. They have a wide selection of abilities. They're very durable. They do incredible damage. And they all have different things that they can do. First off, 
the water elemental can cause a big AoE heal. And if the water elemental is poisoned for any reason, it can apply poison to all targets instead of healing. So you can make it heal or you can poison it and cause damage from it as well. But the heal is actually quite substantial. It is 2d8 to all nearby healthy, or not all nearby creatures. It can heal enemies, but just be, be aware, put it near your teammates. And it's basically like having a healing word across all of your teammates all at once, which is super nice. It does have a single target hit, which is very good, and applies chill, which is useful as well, and has good ranged attacks. The Fire Myrmidon has a big AoE uh, damage plus a single target damage as well. Um, and you can do haste on yourself, which is really useful. So you can haste yourself, do bonus attacks, and do crazy damage in one turn. Again, Fire probably does the highest single target damage out of all of these. You can also summon the Earth Elemental Myrmidon, which has Muck to Metal. You can make your body slippery, increasing your armor class by two and reducing your movement speed. So you can just super tank, kind of like the Flaming Sphere. You can put the Earth Myrmidon in a doorway and they've got to get through him if they want to get to you. And he is just Beef Castle, uh, Beef Castle Flex. And he also has Burrow, which is kind of like the Badger uh, shape form for Druids. You can just teleport to different areas in the arena. And lastly, the Air Myrmidon is one of my favorites, actually, because of Raging Vortex. This is a giant AoE that pulses bludgeoning damage every turn, kind of like Cloud Kill, but it simultaneously deals damage and silences all targets inside of the area. So it's a Cloud Kill that silences targets. It's busted. So if you get all of them in one spot and you stack all enemies together, you put down this, you're doing 2d8 bludgeoning every single turn, and enemies inside can't cast spells. It's just ridiculously strong. And also single target stun and deal damage to the target as well, and go invisible, which is really nice, can have move around the battlefield as well. So you got all these crazy choices, and remember, you can have two minor elementals, a flaming sphere, a quasit, one tier five elemental or a Myrmidon. And what's great is once you unlock your tier six slots, you're pretty much always gonna wanna have a Myrmidon. So you put a Myrmidon down and that means that you can then use uh, your, your five, level five spell slots for something else if you really wanted to. You can do some conjuration channeling. And once you get to this point in the game, once you're level 11 and you can do your Myrmidons, that's when everything just really clicks and you're super strong end game. You have your aura, summon two minor elementals, Summon your Myrmidon, and then you start getting really cheeky. Because remember, we have that level 10 Conjuration Wizard passive that makes it so that when we take damage while channeling or focusing on a spell that is in the Conjuration tree and we're concentrating on it, it cannot be interrupted by damage. So what you can do then is you can go and you cast things like the Black tentle Tentacles here, Everd's Black Tentacles, or you cast, uh, cast Cloud Kill, which is a tier 5. And you can put this down on concentration, and if enemies shoot at you, it won't break, and you already have such high con anyways, that it'll just sit there, and they'll have to either work their way through it. If you have an air Myrmidon, you can put silence on top of it. So you can actually just put down the Everd's Black Tentacles, which forces them to stay rooted. They get smothered, which means that you have advantage on them while they're inside of it. Any attack against them has advantage. They're constantly being rooted. They can't move. The air Myrmidon can silence them in the area, and then you can also just hide behind a corner, and there's nothing they can do to break you from that concentration. And so any boss, any encounter, any amount of enemies, it doesn't matter. If you can find a choke point and you put Everd's Black Tentacles on it, and then you have your minions here, you can just take on an entire army by yourself because they'll come in, they'll get stuck on the tentacles, they can't stop you from concentrating on it, and you're just raining down on them with damage, just blowing them to pieces with as much damage as your elementals have. And if they decide to attack your elementals, you have the demon spirit aura keeping them safe. Now we're gonna talk about gear options for the entirety run of the game, things that work well for this build that you wanna pay attention to and how to get them. So it'll be a little bit spoiler. I'm just gonna show you text. I'm not gonna show you the cutscenes and spoils on the story. I'm just gonna tell you where you get the item and the choices you have to make if it's a choice specific item, like if you have to betray someone or kill someone or uh, you know, unlock a vendor in some way. I'm gonna have that in text on screen, so if you want to avoid those spoilers, you can jump out now, but I'm gonna go through all of the gearing options that you have for the Elemental Summoner throughout the game. For Act 1, you have a bunch of options to choose from. For weapons, most of the quarter staffs will work. One of my favorites is the Staff of Crones, which you get either from the Hag's Vault or for killing the Hag uh, in Act 1, and this has, it's just a 1d8 bludgeoning. It's lower if you have less proficiency. 
it does grant Ray of Sickness as an action, which means you can apply uh, poison. There's not like crazy casting stabs in Act 1, so you just kind of pick that up and use it as you see fit. The Robe of Summer is a good choice. It gives you resistance to cold damage. Some targets use Ice Knife uh, and use like Ice uh, Ray of Frost and things like that, so it does help with those sorts of things. But again, there's not crazy armor options for clothing as well. For gloves, we talked about this already. You want the Abyss Beckoners, and this is in the Zentarim basement just past Joaquin's Rest in Act 1. It's in, in the very back side of it. There's two vault doors that are locked. The right vault is the door that has the gloves in it, and this is the one that gives you that summon aura that's super, super useful. If you decide to betray, kill, or knock out Minthara, you can take her boots. Her boots, uh, the boots of striding, make it so that when you are concentrating on a spell, you can't be knocked prone or moved against your will, which means you can't be yeeted off a cliff. You get athletics plus one, and when you cast a spell that requires concentration, you gain momentum for one turn, so super nice. One of the best Act 1 amulets in the game is the Amulet of Misty Step. This is in the Shattered Sanctum with the Goblins in the Priestess's Bedroom Chest. And this just gives you Misty Step as an action. You don't have to spend a spell slot to get this. Misty Step is good for every build and every playstyle in perpetuity. It's just good across the board. And for rings, I do recommend doing Amalum's Quest in Mykonid Colony and also buy from him at the event once he becomes a vendor as well. You'll have to talk to him, get the quest, go to the Arcane Tower, get the two mushroom types, come back to him and do his quest line. And once you do that, you can get the Ring of Mind Shielding, which is useful for Act 3, but also makes it so you advantage on saving throws against Charmed, which can interrupt your channeling spells as well. The Pearl of the Power Amulet, which is pretty nice, grants Pearlescent Restoration. This is uh, an amulet, actually not a ring, but you can, you can restore spell slots per long rest. And I think this is, all, this is good just for all wizard uh, builds in general. For Act 2, there are, again aren't too many crazy stabs that you can get, but I do recommend getting the Cloak of Protection from Quartermaster Tali. It's just as a cloak that gives you AC uh, plus one and saving throws plus one, which is useful. The Robe of Exquisite Focus from Araj Oblodra, the, the girl who likes st stealing your blood in Moonrise Towers, gives you plus one bonus to spell save difficulty class. So to save against your channeling spells, enemies have uh, have to roll one higher every time, which makes it a lot easier to land those things like hold person uh, or any CCs that you put on top of them, like uh, Avard's um, black tentacle tentacles on the ground. The Vital Conduit Boots from the Githyanki Kresh on the Quartermaster is super nice. When the wearer casts a spell that requires concentration, they gain eight temporary HP and it gives you athletics plus one. If you're running with some undead, uh, you know, animate undead, you can grab the Circle of Bones from Balthazar. You can either kill him, betray him, or you can get it from uh, various different means, but it comes from Balthazar and just gives you, uh, you know, more ward for allied undead minions, and it gives you animate undead if you don't want to use that, uh, learn that as part of your spells that you select. And you also want to get the Ring of Free Action, which is a, uh, just a great ring to have in general for all builds. You get it from Araj again in Moonrise Towers, and this makes it so you ignore the effects of difficult terrain, and you can't be paralyzed or restrained, which is huge. Going into Act 3, that's when things really start to take off. That's when you really start getting all of your best gear, and that's true for most builds. For the Legendary Staff, you want to do the Sorcerer's, Sorceress Sundries um, piece. This is down below inside of the dungeon area, like the puzzle area. And this one is just a Legendary Staff that gives you Spell Save DC plus 1, Spell Attack Rolls plus 1, and you can cast any single spell without consuming a spell slot, which means you can use, like you can cast say your summon a Myrmidon and not use a spell slot, and then you can use that spell slot for tentacles or for cloud kill, that sort of thing. And you can also give yourself elemental resistance as an action as well. You can also go do Cazador's Dungeon and get the Woe Staff, which is just as good, has the spell save DC and the spell attack slots. Um, and you can also get the staff from Lorokin as well if you kill him, uh, which is another, again, you get arcane enchantment, which is what we're really after. If you go to the Devil's Fee uh, in the Lower City and go to the Vendor, she does sell Cloak of the Weave, which is nice, another arcane enchantment. You gain a plus one bonus to spell save DC and spell attack rolls. It's harder for people to avoid your spell saves, the spell save against you. Absorb elements, absorb elemental damage once per short rest, take half damage from the next elemental target, and deal an additional one to six back at the target, which is nice. Robe of the Weave, which you get uh, next to that legendary staff, in Sorceress Sundries, also has an arcane enchantment on it, and when, whenever the wearer succeeds a saving throw against a spell, they gain HP, and your 
Uh, your saving throws are going to be insanely strong at this point anyways. You'll be healing a lot anytime someone tries to target you, which is cool. You can also grab the Gemini gloves from the same vendor uh, in Devil's Fee, which makes it so cantrips targeting foes and allies can target an additional creature. So Firebolt or Acid Splash, things like that. You can put them on multiple targets. You can also hit the same target twice if you wanted to as well. You can also get the Gauntlet of the Tyrant from Gortash if you decide to kill him. This gives you uh, a plus one bonus to spell save DC, which is nice. Another one of those, which is really good. And then lastly, in the uh, dock, dock passageway in Baldur's Gate, like in the Worms Crossway, there's going to be the Bone Spike Boots. And this gives you plus one to AC, which is useful for all casters. And in, uh, you get plus one to saving throws as well while you're not wearing armor or holding a shield, which if you're not running human, you probably won't have a shield on anyways. So it just gives you more tankiness. But all of these, I would say the stabs in Act 3 are probably the most important. And then the gloves in Act 1, the Abyss Beckoners, are going to be the most important. And then the rest, you can just run whatever you find that's super good. But these are ones that benefit the, this build specifically that have different locations throughout the game. So that's what I've got for the Elemental Summoner build. If you found value in the video, leave a like down below. Leave a comment for the algorithm to help this video get seen by more people. And I'll see you on my live stream. If you enjoyed yourself today, leave a like down below. You can support me and my work on Patreon and view Patreon exclusive content, link in the description. Thank you so much for tuning in and I'll see you in the next one.